Following up from the previous video, we're now going to look at how we can prepare these cabinets for manufacturing in the workshop. Since we've already assigned the materials the cutlass is done to, we will look at it in a minute. By assigning some fittings, the information for CNC millings is automatically added as well, so let's see how that works. I've grouped the cabinet so I can edit it in an uncluttered view. As soon as I select Interior CAD's hinge tool, only the relevant adjoining 3D parts are highlighted by Interior CAD by way of displaying a grid onto which the hinges can now be inserted. The list of matching hinges for this construction is displayed in the Vectorworks mode bar. It will populate itself based on previous user choices and hence it only displays user-specific fittings. The full set of hinges can be accessed at the bottom of the menu. Again, only hinges fitting the door's construction will be displayed. All relevant manufacturers are kept up to date, although custom supplies can be added with relative ease by the user. Once a hinge has been chosen, a second menu will display only matching mounting plates. The third menu in the mode bar allows us to choose a custom grid which will govern the position and placement of the hinges. Note that hinge position and numbers will change as the height of the cabinet changes, so if the cabinet's height is reduced by 1500mm, the number of hinges is reduced as well. Changing it back to its former height will add the hinges back. The cool part about InteriorCAD's new generation of tools is its flexible approach to custom builds. Instead of using the grid for hinge placement, you can disable multi-mode and place hinges individually, any way you like. You still have all hinges fully constrained to the cabinet's door and side even when changing its width or moving the whole cabinet. I'm just going to undo the reshape and now I'm selecting the middle hinge and I'm using the standard Vectorworks Move 3D command to change its position. This will still maintain all 3D constraints between cabinet and fittings and also maintain the CNC information required for the position of the drillings. Next I'm going to go ahead and place a drawer. As for the hinges, drawers have a tool which will highlight the boxes designated for drawer placement. A click on the top drawer box will analyse its dimensions and, as with the hinges, apply a filter to the menu of available drawers in the mode bar. The first two modes allow me to switch between wooden drawers and system drawers. And, you've probably guessed, the second menu provides the matching sliders. The chosen combination is retained, so the next drawer is just a matter of clicking and hitting enter. Placing dowels and screws is a similar workflow, but you can hold down shift to place dowels on multiple parts simultaneously. This makes this step in the process even faster. The connector tool creates a special grid allowing to flip the housing of the connector depending on the position of the click. Notice how master snaps help in positioning the connectors. The snap loop is also fully supported. I'm going to finish up by adding some line borings to the adjustable shelves and then it's time to have a look at Interior Cut's main premise that is to offer production realism. As much as the cabinet tool can do, there will always be situations when you'll want to add custom millings to a part or a cabinet. Let's say for the sake of the argument that we need a revision opening in the side of the cabinet. This could be anything from a simple drilling to a full routing contour. I'm going to start by drawing a rectangle right on the side of the cabinet. Next I'm selecting the 3D contour tool. In its mode bar it now has the create from selection button available. A single click on this mode will convert any eligible 2D contour to a routing contour. In order to see the contour, 3D details must be enabled for the cabinet. Now we begin to see what production realism means. Thanks to Interior Cut's full RenderWorks integration, the components of the board are visible as a chipboard core with beach veneer. If I increase the depth of the contour in the object info palette, the center part will fall away as it would with a real workpiece. To make the routing's dimensions compensate for the radius of the tool, I'm switching it to left. Now I can grab the outside of the routing path and snap it to any object in the drawing. This gives me full interactive control of all modifications. OK, it's time to look at the CNC output. I'm going to Interior Cut, then Exports, and then NC Export. The Settings button takes me to the Production Settings dialog, where I have three sub-dialogs. On the first pane of the dialog, Interior Cut lets me choose the machine I want to interface with. Most modern point-to-point -point routers are supported by way of native files. A new 2D DXF output can be customized to be used with all machines that read DXF with layer-based milling assignment. I'm choosing Woodwop which is the right format for all Hormac and Vika CNC routers. On the Tools pane I have configured all the tools that are present on my machine. This is user configurable. 
Once all routers, saws or drills present on your machine have been assigned, you're done save for some machine specific settings you might want to adjust on the machine pane. Ok, let's confirm this dialog and see what we get. So here's a folder with both native woodwop files needed and a CSV cut list. Cut lists output can be adapted to any file format, not just generic CSV. Now all we need to do is open the workpiece files in the CNC workpiece editor and we're done. No further tweaking necessary. Last but not least I'm going to go ahead and run the costing command which, based on cut list information, will give us a costing overview as well as labour hours and material costs for any number of cabinets and 3D parts in our drawing. 